Yeah. Hi, and welcome to Finding Stuff Out. I came all the way up here to the International Space Station because of this question from Veronica. Could kids go to space? I'd like to go. I want to go too. So today, I'm going to train to go to space with the help of some real astronauts. And by the end of the show, I'll be able to tell you how kids can go to space. Who's with me? Let's get some. Would these kids like to go to space? Let's find out. I'd like to go to space so that I could have no sense of direction whatsoever. So I could be the first person to plant a tree on the moon. So I could squeeze a bottle of water and just suck it up with my mouth. Like that. <laughs> well, I would so I couldn't see the sun. To discover the planets. Because then I could meet an alien. See, I already practiced. <laughs> I want to be the first kid to break dance on the moon. I don't want to go to space because I might get dumb and take off my helmet. <laughs> <laughs> Note to self, don't take your helmet off in space. Anyway, here's the next question. It's from Mia. Where did astronauts get the idea to go in space? <laughs> the flat Earth corner! No one really knows who got the idea to go to space. But more than 200 years ago in Paris, Claude Ruggieri was the first person to try it. Step right up, folks. This is your chance to see the very first space travel. With my rocket, I'm going to send this sheep into space. Yikes! Good thing the sheep had a parachute. But Ruggieri had bigger and better plans. Hey, you! I'll send you into outer space. Drats! The Paris police always spoiling my fun. Fortunately, the police stopped him before he had time to send a kid up in the air. His astronauts only got about as high as an office building, which isn't anywhere near space. It was a start, though. If astronauts weren't tied up in space, would they just float away? The short answer is only if they're in space. Every object creates gravity, a force that can pull other objects towards it, sort of like a magnet. So really big objects, like Earth, have a lot of gravitational force. So when you're here on the planet... Hey, get back here. Gravity pulls you back to Earth. But the further away you get, the weaker Earth's gravitational pull is until it can't reach you at all. Aww. So yes, Sabrina, astronauts would just float away if they weren't tied to their spaceship during spacewalks. Gravity can't get me when I'm traveling out in space. Can't pull my pants down or put wrinkles on my face. Cause when I am in the cosmos, far from things with gravity, I can't float around my spaceship free and nothing pulls on me. Here's a question from Andrew. How do astronauts train for zero gravity? You're probably wondering why I'm upside down. In zero gravity, it can feel like blood is rushing to your head. To find out more, I'm calling my friend Jeremy in Houston, who's a real astronaut in training. Hi, Harrison. Uh, I think there might be something wrong with your camera. Oh, oh no, I'm not actually upside down here. <laughs> oh, I see. You're just practicing. Yes. <laughs> Well, great. That's a great way to practice. In fact, uh, sometimes I practice what it's going to be like in microgravity one day. Do you actually practice like that, though? Well, I have, yeah, but not usually. We, we have better ways of doing it. You should come try it sometime. So how do real astronauts do it? 
oh, we have this really cool airplane. And you get in this airplane and it flies up into the sky and then you're just sitting on the floor and it does this roller coaster motion, goes down like this. And while it's diving down, you're in zero gravity. You're floating just like you're in space. And it is a ton of fun. You can fly all over the airplane. You can do flips. Uh, you can tackle your buddies. It's just a really great time. But most importantly, you get to experience what it's going to be like when you're in space. I found some video of you training in a swimming pool. What's that all about? <laughs> right over here, I've got what we use to keep ourselves alive when we're in the pool. I've got a spacesuit here. And this spacesuit, if I were to put you in it, weighs about two to 300 kilograms. So it's really hard to train with here on Earth. It's very, very heavy. But if we put it underwater, we can make it float. And that's how we simulate being in space and working in this space. It's a very cool spacesuit, allows you to do a really cool job out in the vacuum of space outside the space station, but it's also very hard to work in because it's big and bulky. Look at the size of these gloves. Imagine doing fine tasks with this. Yeah, you have like nubby fingers and stuff, it looks like too. <laughs> yeah. You know what else is important to realize is you can't scratch your nose. <laughs> I think it's worth it. Can you imagine the view of our planet from space? Small price to pay. Wow, well, being an astronaut must be pretty amazing. Thanks so much for helping me find stuff out. Hey, my pleasure, Harrison. You take care. So long. Sounds kind of hard to float around in zero gravity on a spaceship. To find out how, it's time for... My Great Challenge! Today, our challengers are Commander Joseph, and Commander Malinka. Are you ready to experience zero gravity? Yes, I am. Me too. All right, well, today you won't be leaving the planet, but you'll definitely be like you're living out on a space station where there's no gravity. You'll be strapped into this simulator. And your challenge is to bounce around, grab these Energizer cells right here, and then get all the way over to that satellite and screw them in. The one that does this the fastest will be the winner. Sound good? Yes. Commander Joseph, you're up first. Yes, sir. Good luck in space. Thank you, Commander Malenka. Go! Zero gravity is sort of like being in a bouncy castle. Oh, missing the... It's as difficult as being in real zero gravity. <laughs> He's got one. Now he has to get it to the satellite. Oh, he dropped it. In real outer space, that energy cell would be floating away forever. To the satellite. Quick, the satellite is losing power. Getting close. Does he have oh, one? He has one. He has one? Yeah, one's in. Joseph's really speeding up, unless he drops this one, too. Yes. Oh, there, he almost has it. He just has to get it in. He's got it. One minute, 25 is the time to beat. I'm ready to win. Go! Get the yellow one. Off on a good start. Yeah, she has a good start. Hey, Malinka, don't just float around. You've got a race to win. Hurry, your spacecraft is losing power. Oh, she has it right away. Oh, does she have it? Yes. Wow, Malinka's fast. Oh, she almost missed it, though. Malinka's only got a few seconds left to beat Joseph's time. Oh, she has Wow, she's going it really fast. And does she have number two? Yes. Yeah, she has it. Okay, Commanders, here are your results. Commander Joseph, your time was one minute and 25 seconds. And Commander Malinka, your time was one minute and 20 seconds. You're the winner. Yes! <laughs> okay, so how did it feel to be an astronaut and bouncing up and down and stuff? It was really fun. I felt like I was wearing a big marshmallow costume. And what about you? What did it feel like? I felt like a floating pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> right, because of the orange suit? Yeah. Well, thanks for being on my show and thanks for helping me find stuff out. You're welcome. My next question is from Cassandra. If I would be able to touch the sky, would it stop or would it continue? I checked the answer, and the atmosphere around the Earth does end eventually. Astronauts have to blast through it to go to space. But space itself goes on forever. There's no end to it. How can that be? It must have an end. But if it did end, what's outside of space? 
There's nothing in space but space! Head getting warm, spatial overload! Ah! You're gonna make my head explode! <sighs> Scientists think that space goes on forever and ever and ever. Kind of scares me to think about that. So, let's think about something else. Who was the first astronaut in space? Well, we know it wasn't Rujiri's sheep. <laughs> but I checked, and here's what I found out. The first astronauts to go up into space <laughs> and safely come back <laughs> Excuse me. were actually two Russian dogs who were sent up in a test program to make sure it was safe for humans to go into space. <laughs> Sweet. Decent. <laughs> But if you mean the first human, that was Yuri Gagarin, a cosmonaut. That's a Russian word for astronaut. More than 50 years ago, in 1961, Gagarin spent 108 minutes in outer space, traveling around the Earth once. Since then, more than 500 people have been to space, some for more than a year. Zero gravity makes me sleepy. Here's a question about that. How do you sleep in space? I found out that astronauts sleep in sleeping bags attached to the wall. That's so the astronauts don't float away. Floating away in your sleep would be really bad. I thought I'd try sleeping their way, but it isn't very comfortable. At least, not here on Earth but I found a video of astronaut Chris Hadfield explaining how it works. I'm in my super comfy Russian full-length pajamas. Nice for when you have to get up in the middle of the night and uh, ready to go to bed. I'll show you where I sleep. Astronaut Chris Hadfield is the first Canadian to walk in space and to command the International Space Station. On his last mission, he went to bed 145 times. This is my sleep station, my sleep pod. This is uh, where I spend up to eight hours every day. Astronauts squeeze a rag. Weird. Everything is just a little bit different in space, like cutting your nails over an air duct that sucks them in so they don't go flying everywhere. Getting a haircut with a vacuum hose on the cutter, and especially washing your hair, as astronaut Karen Nyberg shows us. What I like to do is start by just putting some hot water, squirting it onto my scalp. Sometimes the water gets away from you and you try and catch as much as you can. Then I just work the water up through to the ends of my hair. And I take my no rinse shampoo and squirt it also on the scalp, just a little bit, and rub it in. Again, kind of working it out to the ends. How do astronauts get their food? International Space Station. I'm here at the Canadian Space Agency with Danielle, who's a mission controller. Hi. Hey, so how do astronauts get their food? Well, there are six people living on the real space station, and every few months we launch a spacecraft with food in it. And for some of them, they go right next to the space station, and we have to grab them with a Canada arm. And that's going to be your mission today. Awesome. So, do real astronauts train here? Yes, they do, and you're going to be using the same simulator. Whoa! But first, let's find out about the food that you'll be delivering. For sure. Well, this is Natalie, our space food expert, and this is Harrison, our delivery boy. Nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Well, I'm going to go and set up the simulator. All right. Are you hungry? Whoa! <laughs> look at all this food. Oh, some of it doesn't look very good. It looks kind of weird. Like. What is this? This is macaroni and cheese. So this is just like the macaroni and cheese you have on Earth, except the water's been taken out of it. So when an astronaut's ready to eat it, all he does is put hot water right here, 
wait 10 to 15 minutes, like it says on the instructions. Right. And then you cut this open, and you can just eat it out of out of the package, and like out of a bowl. It'll taste as good as it does on Earth. It'll be delicious. Nice. <laughs> so what can astronauts not eat in space? Any food that makes crumbs. Oh, so they can't eat, like, cookies? Well, they can eat some cookies, as long as those cookies don't make crumbs. And this is an example of cookies that they could eat in space. These are actually crackers, but they're bite-sized, so you could put them in your mouth in, in right. one bite, and you won't make any crumbs. So what's the problem with crumbs floating around in space, though? They can get into equipment, and that can damage the equipment, which can be a problem. Or they can get into an astronaut's eye, oh. not very comfortable. <laughs> or they can breathe them in and get them into their lungs, which can be a problem, too. And we don't want them to choke. Right, that'd be bad. Yeah. So what other foods can they not eat in space? They don't normally eat fresh fruit and vegetables. There's not a lot of refrigeration up there, so there's nowhere to keep the fruit and vegetables fresh. So we have to send them um, dried fruit and vegetables. So for example, this is dried cranberries. Right. It's packaged in packages like this, or it can be in a bar. For example, this is a fruit bar, yeah. and that's another way to get fruit to the astronauts. Nice. But sometimes astronauts might want a little snack. Like. What about these chocolates? They get chocolate in space? They do. Nice. So that's cranberries covered in chocolate. Mm. These are out of this world. They're pretty good, very popular. So I think Danielle's waiting for you to deliver some food to some hungry astronauts. Oh, all right. Let's deliver some food. OK. This is a model of the end of the Canadarm. You're going to use that to go and grab the spacecraft okay. by the spin that we see right here right. and here. So you're going to do that using these two hand controllers or joysticks. Uh, this Danielle showed me how to work the simulator. Left, right. I have to move the Canada arm so that the end locks onto the pin on the shuttle. Then the arm can dock to the space station. Wow, I think I'm going to be good at this because of the years of experience of video games I have. Well, let's see. How many tries do I get? Since we're only training as many as you want, in real life, you only get one shot. One shot. Let's see if I can do it in one try. OK, you're ready to go. There we go. <laughs> Very good. OK. Wow. Are astronauts normally good at this? Well, some of them are. Uh, the ones that used to be fighter pilots tend to be really good. But then there are some that are doctors and scientists and really never had time to play video games. So you might actually be better than them. Whoa. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Getting close. Whoa, OK. I'm almost there. You're doing really well. You're getting closer. Whoa. Standing by for grapple confirmation. Robotic arm finishing closing in. Now. Did it work? Did I get, yeah. Uh, Dragon confirmed in place and docked to the International Space Station at the Harmony Node. I got it. Well, mission accomplished. Now the astronauts can eat. I'm like a real astronaut now, sort of. We could make an astronaut out of you, I think. Well, thanks for being on my show. Do you think I could really be an astronaut one day? Uh, sure, if you apply yourself, get a good education, and you definitely have the video game part down. So, uh, good luck. Thanks. This is awesome. Hey, I've got a call. It's from Jeremy. Hey, Harrison. Good to see you again. They told me you were at the Canadian Space Agency training with him on Canada Arm 2. Yeah, they said that I could apply to be an astronaut someday, but is it possible for a kid like me to go to space right now? Well, not right now, Harrison, but one day. Oh, I guess I can answer the question that started us off. Could kids go to space? I'd like to go. The big answer is... Apparently we can't. No, no, hang on, Harrison. That's not it at all. But I thought you said you couldn't take kids with you. Well, that's partially correct. We're not taking kids to space right now. But one day, when those kids get older, they can definitely be astronauts. And we're going to need astronauts to fly in space. There are amazing things happening in space right now. We have liftoff of Falcon 9. Dragon is sent for stage acceleration. In fact, for the first time in history, commercial companies are building new rockets to take people to space. And more and more people are going to be flying in space in your lifetime. 
In fact, I think one day it's going to be kids who are about seven, ten years old that'll be the first humans to walk on Mars. Whoa, that's awesome. So I guess the astronauts of the future are kids today. Absolutely. You know what you have to do if you want to be an astronaut? You just have to do your very best. That's all you have to do. Find out what you love to do in life, follow that passion for the things you love, and just do your best. Awesome. Well, thanks for being on my show. I'm going to go train right now. On the job training, there's nothing like it. But being in space makes me hungry. Time for a space snack. Ah, oh, pesky helmet. Uh oh. Note to self don't dig helmet off in space. Thanks for watching Finding Stuff Out. <laughs> Hi, welcome to Finding Stuff Out, the show where I answer your burning questions of the day. Like... Why does the moon follow us? Yes, Carl, why does the moon follow us? I wondered that myself recently while I was out for a walk. Did you ever get the feeling that you were being followed? <laughs> It's you! <laughs> I caught the moon following me. Why does the moon follow us? I don't know, but we're about to find out what tricks that moon is up to. And by the end of the show, I'll have the answer to your question. Here's one from Jessica. Why is there a moon? Why is there a moon? I don't know. I know that it's there in the sky, but I've never really thought about why. And now you've got me thinking about it a lot. Did it just show up on our doorstep one day? Like a cat? It's mind-boggling! How did something so big get there? Why is there a moon? Ah! You're going to make my head explode! To answer your question... I went to the moon! Just kidding. If I really was on the moon, my face would expand and I wouldn't be able to breathe. Hey! Hey, Rover! Are you following me too now? But seriously, I'm here today at the Canadian Space Agency in a place called the Sandbox, which is very similar to the surface of the moon. And here I am with Caroline Emmanuel Morissette, who's a lunar geologist. Hi, Harrison. Hi. So what is the whole point of this sandbox? Well, we can use it to practice for possible future lunar missions. The astronauts practice down here, so they know what to do on the real moon. This is the perfect place to answer your question. Why is there a moon? Caroline says that most scientists think it's because of something called the giant impact. It's the giant impact theory. So did it involve giants like Jack and the Beanstalk swinging clubs like this? <laughs> no, <laughs> it didn't. Caroline tells me that according to the giant impact theory, billions of years ago, an asteroid as big as Mars smashed into the Earth. Parts of the Earth and parts of the asteroid shattered into pieces, then joined together to form the moon that we now see in our sky. So in all the vastness of space, there's a chocolate cupcake orbiting around the sun, minding his own business, when all of a sudden, hey there, buddy, this is my orbit. Get your own, pal. I'm sorry, I'm out of control, I can't help it. Yes, you can. Out of all the orbits in the galaxy, you have to choose mine. Whoa! You got vanilla icing all over me. No, you got chocolate icing all over me. So the moon is made up of bits of vanilla cupcake and chocolate cupcake. Or, as an astronomer would put it, the moon is made up of bits of the Earth and bits of the asteroid that hit the Earth. Next question. Why does the moon have bumps like that? Yeah, why does the moon have so many bumps? 
when the Earth and the Moon formed. Caroline says when the Earth and the Moon were made billions of years ago, there was so much stuff floating around in space that rocks and planets were always bashing into each other. Even today, new craters get made on the Moon. It happens when meteoroids, that stone or metal debris from space, crash into it. Wow, I made my own mini crater. I wondered why those meteoroids don't hit the Earth too. Caroline tells me it's because the Earth's atmosphere is like a shield. The meteoroids burn up when they try to get in. When you see a shooting star, it's really a meteoroid burning up in the Earth's atmosphere. But the moon doesn't have an atmosphere to shield it, so it gets hit. How big can the craters be? Well, some are very large, so you could take a day to cross them in a car. What? That's crazy. Yeah. So thanks for being on my show and helping me find stuff out. It was out of this world. Oh, well, it's my pleasure, Arison. Thank you. OK, Rover. Ready? Oh, good boy. Yeah! Good boy, Rover. Yeah, good job. Good boy. Yes, you are. Good boy. Street smarts. So, we all know that the Earth is made of, well, Earth. And water. And what about plants? And rocks. But what is the moon made out of? I have these kids here to help me find out. Craters. Lots of gray stuff. Dirt. Dirt. White grass. I think it is made of mozzarella or Parmesan cheese. <laughs> and I, if, I was, if I were to go to the moon, I would be sitting there all day long eating cheese. Do you think you'd get sick of the cheese? Yes, I would. <laughs> Here's a question from Evan. Why does the moon light at night but not so much during the day? Well, Evan, I found the answer on the website for NASA. They're people who explore space. This is the moon at night. It's brightly lit up. And this is it during the day. You're right, Evan. It's not so bright now. But why? I think this calls for... <laughs> the experiment! The NASA article suggested this experiment. Pretend this is the sun. And this mirror is the moon. There's a lot of light. So when I put it over here, we can still see the mirror. It just doesn't stand out a lot against the bright daytime sky. But when it's night, my mirror looks bright against the dark sky. Whether it's day or night, we can see the moon because it reflects the light from the sun. The moon doesn't make any light of its own. Look, if I turn the sun off, no more shiny moon. So the moon has another disappearing trick up its sleeve, as Marissa points out. Why sometimes the moon is full, but sometimes the moon is not full? Marissa, that's a very challenging question, and the answer calls for... My Great Challenge! Okay, contestants, let's take a look at the phases of the moon. Marissa is right. Here the moon is full. You can see all of it. But now, watch that moon start to disappear. It gets dark on one side, and it keeps getting darker a little more each night until you can only see half the moon. Eventually, you can only see a sliver of it until it looks like a giant toenail clipping. I hope you don't leave those under your bed. Moms hate that. Well, at least mine does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mine hates that too. Anyway, finally it reaches the new moon stage. That's when we can't see it at all. Then, it gradually reappears until it's the full moon again. That's my favorite phase, could you tell? Yeah. And it's also my signal to start this challenge. You're gonna wear these way cool hats. Yay! Here comes the sun. Now, you are the earth and you are the moon. Your job is to find the new moon, which is the one that disappears. Go. Marissa, the challengers are bending their brains to figure out the answer to your question. Why is the moon full sometimes, and not full at other times? Hmm, team number one seems to be having trouble figuring it out. 
I guess they've got a lot on their minds. Get it? Slower. Faster. Here, or there. Can't really see the moon when it's there. Yes, you're correct. When the moon is between the sun and the earth like that, that's when you can't see the moon as well. That's because the sun isn't shining on the side of the moon you can see. Now, the second part of the challenge is for you to find the full moon. Go. Now. Correct. As you see, now the Earth is between the moon and the sun, and the moon is fully lit. That's because the sun is shining on the side of the moon that you can see. You guys took one minute and 50 seconds to complete the challenge. Here comes the sun again. Okay, team number two, now it's your turn. You're trying to find the new moon, is, which is when you can't see it. Are you ready? Yep. Okay, go. Can team number two figure it out faster than team number one? There. You're correct. As you see, the moon is between the sun and the earth, and now you can't see the moon. So now you're trying to find the full moon. Are you ready? Yep. Okay, go. The clock is ticking. If they can do it on their first try, they'll win this challenge. There. Correct again. As you see, now the Earth is between the sun and the moon, making the moon full. That was amazing. You guys did it in 17 seconds. Yahoo! Yeah! Congratulations. The winner of the challenge is team number two. Yahoo! Thomas, you did it really fast. Why did it come so easily to you? I knew that when all the light would be on it, it would be the full moon, and that when none of the light would be on it, it would be the new moon. Did you learn that in school, or where did you learn? Well, I don't remember, actually. <laughs> you just knew, because you're a genius. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Why do people say the moon tastes like cheese? The short answer is because they've never tasted moon rocks, which don't taste anything like cheese. The moon made out of cheese? That would be awesome! In the 17th century, someone noticed the moon looked like green cheese. People joked around a lot about it being cheese. Apparently, people are easily tricked because it caught on quite quick that the moon was made of... Gouda, feta, cheddar, Swiss cheese. Unfortunately, it's none of these. Moon! Why do wolves howl at the moon? That's a really interesting question. Let's take a look at some wolves howling. Wolves howl a lot. They even howl in the daytime. I checked, and wolves are more active on nights when the moon is bright, since, just like with us, it helps them see. And the more active they are, the more they howl. So it's not that they are howling at the moon. It's just that when the moon is bright, they're most likely to be going out doing all the things that wolves like to do, like howling. Wolves hold their head up high when they howl, which is why if they're howling when the moon is out, it looks like they're howling at the moon. But speaking of wolves and full moons... Does the moon turn peoples into werewolves? <laughs> the Flat Earth Corner! Does the moon turn people into werewolves? Well, as everyone in medieval Europe knows, duh, of course it does. I'm actually getting as hungry as a wolf. I really could use some moon cheese. Strange. That one didn't sound like my stomach. Werewolf! Again! People used to believe that the full moon turned people into werewolves. But the truth is, there's no such thing as werewolves, except in movies. But that doesn't mean you have to tell your little brother or sister. Speaking of weird movie ideas about the moon, check this out. The full moon is the brightest object in the night sky. So 
it's no wonder that it pops up in so many myths, songs, and stories. And in this old movie. People have been dreaming about going to the moon for a long time, even if they didn't get all the details right. not exactly how it happened, but it brings me to my next question, which is from Steven. I want to know who was the first man on the moon. Well, it definitely wasn't this guy. Or these guys. But there really was a first man on the moon. The first man on the moon is on board this rocket. He went a long time ago, in 1969. Two other astronauts are with him in the rocket. It traveled about 400,000 kilometers. That's the same distance as going around the Earth 10 times. When they got there, one of the astronauts, Neil Armstrong, became the first person to walk on the moon and talk on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Altogether, 12 people have been to the moon. They collected moon rocks and soil and they also seem to spend a lot of time bobbing around. As Destiny has noticed... Why do we float on air when we walk on the moon? Well, Destiny, walking on the moon feels a lot like walking on a trampoline, because the moon has a lot less gravity than the Earth does. So we don't weigh as much on the moon as we do on Earth. I was strolling on the moon one day In a merry, merry month of December May, May so if you weigh about 70 pounds on Earth, like me, then you probably weigh only about 12 pounds when you're on the moon. That's the same as, like when you were a baby. That's me! I'm so cute. I wasn't so bad when I was a baby either. Anyway, this gives me a good idea for my do try this at home. Uh oh, do try this at home. To get a sense of how different it would be if you were on the moon, try this. Wait, I think I can do better. Let's try that again. Now you try. Are you ready? And jump! Good. If you were like most kids, you probably jumped between a quarter of a meter and a half a meter. But if you were on the moon, you'd be able to jump six times higher. That's about three meters. That's higher than most ceilings. That would be pretty cool. Ah! Note to self, don't try this at home if your house is on the moon. Ah! Now here's a question about something that happens right here on Earth. How does the moon control the waves? The answer is pretty amazing. Our sun's gravity pulls on the Earth, which is why the Earth circles the sun. Ha ha ha! Our gravity has got a lot of gravity. Huh. Earth's gravity pulls on the moon, which is why the moon circles us. I've got some influence on my own! But even while the Earth is pulling on the moon, the moon also affects the Earth. You're not the only one with pull around here. That blue is Earth's ocean. Because Earth is always spinning, the moon is constantly pulling at different parts of it. That makes the tide or water level of the ocean higher in the parts of the Earth closest to the moon. There's also a high tide on the opposite side of the Earth, because the moon pulls harder on the Earth than on the water over there. If you don't live near the ocean, or have never been there and seen the tide come in, it's pretty amazing. Check this out. This is the Bay of Fundy in Nova Scotia. It has the highest tides in the world. The difference between high and low tide here is almost 17 meters. That's the height of a five-story building. And look, this turbine uses tides to create electricity. See the wheel turning?
And some people have used the moon's tides to have fun. Like these people surfing on a tidal river in Great Britain. I say this is jolly good. Yeah, hang ten, mate. Well, the moon is pretty awesome. It's beautiful to look at, it's our closest neighbor, and it has a strong effect on our planet. So there's just one last thing we have to figure out, and that's the answer to the question that brought me on this lunar quest to begin with. Why does the moon follow us? So, Carl, your big answer is... Remember when I said astronauts traveled 400,000 kilometers to reach the moon? Well, that is very, very far away. But these buildings are really close. When I walk down the street, I pass the houses and trees quite quickly. But the moon is so far away that it doesn't seem like you're walking past it. And that's why it seems like the moon follows us. Actually, the moon has some traveling of its own to do, and I'll show you that right now. If you stay in one spot and watch long enough, you'll see that during the night, the moon appears to travel far across the sky, because the Earth is turning. See you next time for more Finding Stuff Out. Later! Try to follow me now! I would sure love to go to the moon one day. What about you guys? Yes! Because I love cheese! <laughs> Hi, welcome to Finding Stuff Out. Today, I'm dressed up fancy because your questions have inspired me to have a big star on the show. The biggest, most famous star on Earth. Wait, did I say on Earth? I mean, the biggest star in our whole solar system. Put your hands together for the sun! Yeah, the sun! Yeah, the sun! We love the sun! Yes! The sun truly is a star. But if it's so great, then how come, as Anastasia asks? Why can't everything be solar powered? Solar is another word for sun, as an energy from the sun. The sun is very, very big compared to the planets in our solar system, including Earth. And it also has unimaginable amounts of energy. So I wonder, maybe everything could be powered by the sun like this solar-powered baseball cap with a fan to keep me cool, or this solar-powered bobblehead. And how about using the sun to cook food? This is a solar cooker I made. It doesn't need any electricity or flames to cook things, just sunlight. Well, that's what they say. But is it really true? Let's check back at the end of the show to see what happens to this egg. Meanwhile, you sent me a lot of other questions about the sun that need to be answered, like this one from James. What is the sun made of? Well, James, I checked and found out that the sun is a giant ball of super hot gas, mostly hydrogen and helium. Some of it is like what's inside of this helium balloon. But what's happening to the gases inside of the sun is incredible. Here's why. Gravity is a force that holds us onto the Earth and keeps us from being flung out into space as it spins. Without it, this would happen. The sun is huge compared to the Earth, so its gravity pulls on the Earth and all the other planets in our solar system, so they circle around the sun. The sun's gravity is so powerful, it actually squashes the hydrogen in its core, which is this part deep inside it. When that happens, it creates incredible amounts of energy as it turns the hydrogen into helium. Okay, my balloon isn't really doing that. It's not big enough to have that kind of gravity, but if I squish it enough, maybe it'll create enough pressure to have my own mini sun and power something. I'm not giving up. I'm going to bring in an expert to help me do this. She discovers galaxies, so I bet she can help me. Please welcome my special guest, astrophysicist, Dr. Tracy Webb. Hey, Harrison. Hey. I brought you a picture. Whoa, is that anybody I know? Well, it might look familiar. It's a galaxy, very much like our own Milky Way galaxy, the one that the sun lives in. 
What is a galaxy? Well, a galaxy is a collection of usually billions or even tens of billions of stars which are held together in space by their own mutual gravity. They're kind of like an island universe within the universe itself. Wow, billions of stars. If Tracy knows that much about space, maybe she can help me make my own sun. Okay, so I have this balloon filled with helium and a bit of hydrogen, just like the sun. Yes, I'm gonna compress you into a sun with this. Oh, it's almost there. It's getting warm. I can feel the heat building up. Oh, now I don't have Mr. Sun or Mr. Balloon, but at least I still have you, Tracy. What went wrong? Well, the hydrogen and the helium in the balloon doesn't actually want to be squished together. So it fights back. That's what we call pressure. And you're just not strong enough to squish all of those atoms together. But I can show you what's happening in the center of the sun using this demonstration with Play-Doh. Okay. We're gonna pretend that these four yellow Play-Doh balls are hydrogen atoms. And now we're gonna put 100 million elephants on top of it. I don't have 100 million elephants. And that's gonna create the pressure, like the pressure in the core of the sun, and it's gonna squish these hydrogen atoms together mm -hmm. to form helium. And when it does that, it releases energy. Well, I don't know where I'm gonna find 100 million elephants, but I do know where to find another question. Why is the sun a star? Yeah, why is the sun a star? Well, the sun is a star like every other star that we see in the sky. It just looks different because it's so much closer to us. And for a long time, we did think that it was something different, but now we know that it's not. But it's still a really important star because it's the center of our own solar system and it is the brightest thing in the sky. That's right, Mr. Sun. You'll always be special to us. Even if out there you're just one of millions. I mean, billions. I mean, how many stars are there? There's over a billion stars in our own galaxy, and there are billions and billions of galaxies in the universe. So would it be like how many grains of sand are in this bucket? No, nope, there's more than that. More than this? What about the grains of sand in this whole pool here? No, you would have to take more grains of sand than are on all of the world's beaches, and you probably still wouldn't even have enough stars. Yeah, my parents aren't gonna let me bring more sand in here. So let's bring back the sun for another question. Right. Why, when you look at the sun, your eyes burn? Yeah, why is that? Well, unlike the stars, the sun is really close to us, so the light from the sun is still very energetic when it reaches the Earth. The stuff that damages your eyes is called ultraviolet light, and you can't see it, and you can't feel it actually burning your eyes. So it's kind of like when I go to the beach, I put on sunscreen. Yeah, it's the same stuff that gives you a sunburn, and you don't know that you're getting a sunburn until it's too late also. What about during an eclipse? During an eclipse, an eclipse is when the moon passes in front of the sun and blocks all the visible light, but it doesn't actually block the UV light. That can still come through to your eyes, even though you can't feel it or see it. So you should never look into the sun even during an eclipse? Never. Are all the sun's invisible rays dangerous? No, not all of them. And in fact, some of the stuff that comes, some of the energy that comes from the sun can produce things that are very beautiful on Earth, like the Northern Lights. Oh, I think I have some video of that. They're so beautiful, what makes them happen? Well, you remember that I said the sun was a big ball of gas, and that gas was made up of particles of hydrogen and helium. And a lot of those particles are being blown off from the surface of the sun all the time, and we call this the solar wind. And that wind of particles goes through space and gets captured by the Earth in the North and the South Pole. And as those particles come down into our atmosphere, they collide with other particles, oxygen and nitrogen, and cause this explosion of light that we see. The Experiment. For those of you who have never seen the Northern Lights, you can do a quick little experiment at home to see what they look like. Awesome. So get an adult to help you assemble all these different ingredients. You need some 2% or whole milk. You need some pretty food coloring colors. Yeah. And some regular dish soap. Okay. And what we're gonna do is we're going to pour the milk into this pie plate here. Okay. And then once it's settled down just a little bit, we're gonna put some green in and some red. We don't want them to mix yet, so I'm putting them separately. Right. And then and the some blue. blue. Whoa. And then I'm gonna take the dish soap and just put a little bit right in the middle. Whoa, cool. 
So you see how it makes swirls and curtains. That's exactly what the northern lights look like. Cool. Thanks for helping us find stuff out. Now here's a question from James. What would happen if someone walked on the sun? The short answer is the worst sunburn you'll ever have in your life. And that would be a very short life if you tried to walk on the sun because it's so hot. <laughs> Yikes! My toesies! The sun is so hot, you wouldn't even be able to get close enough to walk on it. But if you could beam yourself up onto it, you'd be burned up in less than a second. And it's not solid anyway, so it'd be like trying to walk on a burning cloud. Scary! Which leads to a question from Kevin. How hot is the sun? How hot is it? Hot enough to give me a sunburn. Hot enough to melt crayons. The sun is hotter than all the candles. Hotter than an oven. Hotter than a furnace. Hotter than my head, which is getting really hot. 150 million kilometers times all those degrees. Solar meltdown, here I come. Ah! You're going to make my head explode. I checked and found out that the hottest thing on Earth is the lava from a volcano. It can be 1,300 degrees Celsius. That's 40 times hotter than a really hot summer day. But the surface of the sun is 6,000 degrees. That's more than four times hotter than a volcano. But the center of the sun is way hotter than that, 15 million degrees. That's more than 11,000 times hotter than a volcano. Luckily for us, we're just the right distance away from the sun's heat. Scientists call it the Goldilocks effect. It's kind of like this. If the Earth was further away from the sun than it is now, like where Mars is, the sun's heat wouldn't reach us and warm the Earth enough for life to exist. Aw, my porridge is too cold. In fact, everything is too cold. If the Earth was closer to the sun, like where Venus is, the sun's heat would be too strong. Huh? And now my porridge is on fire! Ah! Person, get me out of here! Ah, not too hot, not too cold. Everything is just right. Except someone ate all my porridge! You see. Why does the sun have to come out in the day and not at night? <laughs> Want to know the answer? Well, you've come to the right place. I'm Homer, the famous Greek poet from the 9th century BC. So, why does the sun come up in the morning and go away at night? Well, as anybody in ancient Greece who's read my work knows, duh, it's because the sun god Helios rides his sun chariot across the sky every morning and disappears at night. Like this. Oh. Oh. Ah, yeah! This is so much fun! I told you. Nowadays, we know that the sun is the center of our solar system and the Earth circles around it, spinning. So unless you live in the North or South Pole, the sun comes up in the morning and goes away at night, like this. The Earth, it spins around and around so the sun comes up and the sun goes down. At night, we're turned away from the sun, but it's back again when the morning comes. At night, we're turned away from the sun, but it's back again when the morning comes. We have morning and night because the Earth is always spinning. That gave the ancient people a solar-powered way to tell the time, before clocks and watches were invented. It's called a sundial. Thousands of years ago, people used it to tell the time. It works by the sun casting a shadow on it. And that's today's... My Great Challenge! Today, my great challengers are Amelia and Mateo. The awesomest. <laughs> okay, so you're gonna be Team Ra after the Egyptian sun god. Yeah. And you're gonna be Team Sana after the Viking sun goddess. So your challenge today is to find out the time using the sun. Well, actually it's a flashlight, but it will represent the sun. I've made a giant sundial on the floor. The piece of a sundial that casts the shadow is called a gnomon. Each one of you will try to find two different times of the day at different times of the year. 
The one to do it in the shortest time will be the winner. And remember, in the Northern Hemisphere, the sun lays low in the winter and it's high in the sky in the summer. That's why there's two rows of numbers on my sundial. These are the summer times and these are the winter times. So Team Raw, you're gonna be first and Team Sana, you can go downstairs so you can't cheat. Okay, here's your sun. Your first challenge is to find 9 a.m. in January. Go! Mateo is moving the gnomon onto the square for January. Good move. He gets his shadow in the right direction, but here's the tricky part. Yep, remember you have to have the point on the number. Mateo needs to try and make his shadow shorter. He's raising his sun. Now lowering it. And there you have it. That's about how high in the sky the sun would be at 9 a.m. in January. Now let's see how Amelia does. Are you ready for the first challenge? Yeah. Okay, 9 a.m. in January, go. Amelia quickly puts down her shadow caster. Now she's got to get the shadow to point to 9 a.m. Close, but that's 10 o'clock. She's moving the sun over, but it's got to be at the right height in the sky. She's raising it higher in the sky now, hitting nine o'clock. But that would be where the sun hits in the summertime. Remember, it's January. Amelia is lowering the sun a bit. There, she has it, okay. Amelia does it in one minute and 22 seconds. Okay, are you ready for your second challenge? Yes. 4 p.m. in July, go. The sun in the summer is higher in the sky. Let's see if the challengers figure it out. Mateo raises his sun. He's found the sun's position at four o'clock in the winter, but I asked for four o'clock in July. On July. And there you go, he's found it. Second challenge, go. Amelia rushes to make up for lost time. Oh. It looks like she learned from last time. Okay, you're getting really close. There, she has it. And she did it. Now let's see who had the fastest combined times. Okay, so Team Sana, you had a time of one minute and 44 seconds. Pretty good. And Team Ra, you had a time of one minute and one second. You're the winner. Ooh, yeah. So. Thank you for playing my great challenge. Now here's another sun question. How do solar panels work? Well, I know they take light and turn it into electricity, but I don't know how, so I went somewhere very cool to find out. This is Monty Gisborne, and he knows all about solar panels and how they work. And this is a solar powered boat, and he's offered to take me on a ride. Thanks, Monty. My pleasure, Harrison. Welcome aboard the Osprey, North America's largest solar-powered vessel. Awesome. Let's go. This boat is much quieter than a gas-powered boat because its motors are electric and are powered by solar panels. What we have here to show you is a solar panel, which okay. is the primary source of energy that goes into this boat. Right. Basically, the rays from the sun strike upon the panel and excite the molecules of these crystals, which in turn creates electrons. Electrons is what electricity is made of. Right. The electrons start to flow through all of these cells individually. Okay. And that creates a circuit that flows through these wires, and then that energy is available for when our captain here needs to hit the throttle and make the boat go forward. Okay. I'm getting worried, though. We've traveled far, and it's getting kind of cloudy. So if it got cloudy, like, right now, would the boat just stop, or would it keep going, or how would that work? Well, the truth is... Uh-oh, I can feel bad news coming. This battery pack is about 10 kilowatt hours. Oh, good. That sounds like a lot. That's about a dollar's worth of electricity. <laughs> We're doomed. But that can run this boat for about five hours. That's like a day's trip right there. <laughs> there it is. Perfect. We've got plenty of battery power left for me to drive us back. Good thing I have my boating license. And the best thing about this boat is it doesn't pollute. 
Solar power, ahoy! Well, this is great. <laughs> If you could have anything that was solar powered, what would it be? A car and a computer. A car. A car? Maybe like your toy car? A TV. Cars, because if you use fuel or gas, it will ruin the environment. I would do different public buildings like hospitals or schools, because then anyone in the world could use them. Nice. And what about you? A blender and a bathtub, because I really like both of those things. A blender and a bathtub. Those are two of my favorite things, too. But don't combine them. That's a bad idea. And that brings me back to the question that started this solar quest. Why can't everything be solar powered? Well, Anastasia, the big answer is... Almost everything does run on solar power, indirectly at least. Plants use the sun's energy to grow. The wind that sailboats and wind generators use is made by the sun heating up the air. The rivers that run hydroelectric plants need the sun too. The sun evaporates the water, carrying it up to the sky where it cools, falls as rain or snow, then eventually flows down into the rivers again. Even the gasoline that we use to run our cars and the coal that we use to run some electrical generators were once, long ago, living plants that depended on the sun for energy. But I think you mean, why can't we get all of our power from solar panels? Well, maybe one day we can. Scientists are developing solar panels that can capture more and more of the sun's energy and convert it into electricity better than solar panels use today. Hey, that reminds me. It's time to check on my egg. Oh, that's hot. I'll use this. Oh, it worked. That's excellent. So maybe by the time we're grown-ups, our cars, schools, businesses, and homes, and everything inside them will be solar-powered by the sun. But until then, I'm gonna wear this solar-powered hat to keep cool. Ah, that's better. See you next time for more Finding Stuff Out. Hey, this banana got its energy from the sun, and now I'm eating it. So I guess I'm solar-powered too. You want a bite? Well, I guess you'd rather have your solar power direct. Mmm, solar power. You bet. <laughs>